Hi everyone, uh, I want to talk to you about sustainable open source. So open source is eating the world, or actually it has eaten the world already, spoiler alert, um, but it's also a victim of its own success. Um, so there's maintainers who take over a abandoned project and they don't always have the best intentions at heart. And then there's enterprises who rely on open source dependencies that are maintained by a single individual. And th that single individual is in over their head. Um, organizations and individuals end of life or sort of like limit the access to technology that we've all come to rely on. We're in a bit of a pickle, you might say. Um, so how can we as individuals and organizations make sure that open source is reliable and sustainable for all the generations to come? So hi, my name is Flor Reis. I'm a staff developer advocate at Ivan. Yes, Mehdi is my manager. I promise you it's not awkward at all. <laughs> um, I'm also, I used to work in DevRel at Grafana Labs and at Microsoft. I'm a organizer for DevOps Days Amsterdam, DevOps Days Eindhoven, and I'm also part of DevOps Days Core, um, the organization. Then I'm a Microsoft MVP. This list will end. Uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP. Um, I'm uh, awarded for my work, in, my community work in the developer technologies space, uh, and I run a monthly virtual first and only meetup on open source topic called uh, Contributing Today. Uh, we're definitely going to kick off again now that next month is Hacktoberfest. Uh, anyone participating in Hacktoberfest? Excited about Hacktoberfest? Yes. Awesome. I am. Um, all right. Let's get started. Um, I want to talk about two particular topics that are plaguing open source right now, uh, and in particular, it's sustainability. Um, there's definitely more issues in open source, like I would love for open source to be a more um, inclusive and equitable space, but I only have 30 minutes, so I'm going to focus on two topics. Um, the first one is the topic of relicensing. So projects are relicensing or cha changing to a different license because they want to avoid free writing, uh, and then particularly by cloud vendors, um, or they want to avoid people from using their code to do bad stuff, uh, or they just want to alleviate responsibility. Then another problem is that proverbial, like, uh, the, the project that is maintained by the proverbial single individual in Nebraska, shout out to this wonderful XKCD, if you haven't seen it before, it's my favorite, I use it all the time. Um, and somehow also in contributing today meetups, we always come back to this, uh, this topic. So while curl is successfully maintained by Daniel Stenberg, mostly in its lonesome for a long, long time, for every curl there's a log4j. And for every NPM library you bring in, you bring in a whole host of NPM libraries and uh, equal amount of vulnerabilities. Then there is a lack of resources that prevent maintainers to spend the time on their projects that the projects would really warrant if you look at what kind of enterprises you know, rely on that software. Um, and then maintainers sometimes make very rash decisions, like they're just like humans, like you and me. Um, so for instance, uh, we've seen maintainers pull their code when they found out that it had been used by uh, ICE, by the US uh, Customs and Immigration Management, right, like the, that organization, or uh, to protest Russia's attack on Ukraine most recently. Um, so in the past couple of years, we've seen uh, a couple of new licenses appear. Uh, and I want to go through a couple of them just to have a look at them and see how they differ from maybe what the standards are for an open source license, so, uh, as in what is defined by the open source initiative as an open source license. Um, one of the new ones is the Commons Clause, uh, which aims to restrict the free writing that uh, cloud vendors have been doing. Um, their beef is that cloud vendors haven't been giving back to open source, they're just sort of taking and also taking away their business model. If you consider open source a business model, you're wrong, uh, but you know, like some people think, like to think that it is. Um, the Commons Clause uh, conflicts with the FSD because it, uh, that's, that says you have the right to use software for any purpose, and also with the open source definition in that the license shall not restrict any party from uh, selling or giving away said software. Um, there's also a lot of ambiguous wording because it says like value derived entirely or substantially because what is considered value, what is considered substantial. 
Um, MongoDB used it for a while, Redis Labs used it for a while, uh, and then both of them moved on to more, even more cloud restrictive or available source type licenses. Um, so particularly Mongo moved to SSPL in 2018, uh, which is kind of like the GPL, but then with some restrictions. Uh, it's not approved by the open source uh, initiative. Again, they're the uh, stewards of the open source definition. Um, and it forces a very uh, uh, wide copyleft impact on cloud infrastructure. Uh, copyleft means that whatever you're publishing, uh, if, if you're using software that has a copyleft license, you, uh, all of the software that you write or it interferes with should also be open source under a license that is approved by the OSI. Um, there are justification, cloud vendors. Uh, and in their case, it was Amazon Web Services in particular. Um, AWS then later released DocumentDB or DynamoDB or InfiniDash or whatever they call all of their services. Um, and the MongoDB community was sort of like left divided over this license change. Um, we have Redis source available uh, for certain Redis modules, but not all of them. Core Redis still remains under the BSD uh, 3. And um, it's a license to do like all of the usual, what you expect from an open source license, so use, modify, distribute, all of that stuff, unless uh, you want to make it available as a database pro uh, product or in a database product. Um, so again, to allow the community to you know, work on their applications, but make sure that they can't sell anything. Uh, of course, 100% directed at cloud providers. Um, Elastic 2.0. Uh, you'll find clauses, again, to restrict cloud vendors or hosted or managed services from uh, using Elastic in their offering, uh, but it also prevents uh, uh, third parties from obscuring trademark notices or brand, uh, and it can even embed license keys, which is very much not an open source thing, um, to avoid circumvention. Uh, Elasticsearch and Kibana got removed from uh, infrastructure like Azure and AWS as a result. There's a couple of different uh, ones, like the Grayscale one, uh, the Timescale uh, uh, TSL license, uh, which is an interesting one. It basically says no Timescale as a service and no forking. Um, the Confluent Community license is an interesting one. You can use Modify Distribute unless it competes with Confluent's business. And I mean, Confluent's business can be a moving target. Maybe they want to move into a different market. What does it mean then? Um, there's also, also different licenses called ethical licenses, if you've heard of those. Um, so they, uh, there's the ethical source movement, and they think that while, while open source has you know, like benefited from great success, it hasn't been able to move on uh, uh, or like move past and uh, adapt to the world that we live in right now, and it feels like um, developers uh, or creators don't have any recourse over people using the stuff that they build and they want to course correct that. So there's a couple of different ethical licenses like the Hippocratic license uh, that is uh, immediately tied to uh, human rights violations uh, or MI5 uh, which is tied to the code of conduct for a certain project. Um, there's a couple of other ones that are really like trying to make sure that the maintainer limits who is using their code for what. I'm not going to dive into ethical, so ethical source or ethical licenses anymore, but if you're interested, you should definitely uh, check out ethicalsource.dev uh, and figure out what they're about and maybe support them. This is a tweet recently by Tierney, who used to be my uh, colleague at Microsoft, and it sort of really hits home, uh, again, saying that open source hasn't evolved to a point where we can uh, have, uh, where, where we feel like the open source definition really meets, needs our meet. Meets our needs. Yes, got it. Um, and I know what you're thinking, right? Like open source is not about licenses. It should not be about licenses. It's about sharing and freedom and you know, collaboration. Uh, and license should just be sort of like a way to formalize the relationship and then we'll move on from that really quickly. Um, but I think the discussion around the cloud restricted licenses has been a really interesting one and a really important one to have in the community. Um, it's just not a way to save open source from you know, being used by others. Uh, again, open source is not a business model. 
Um, it didn't save open source because it takes a lot of code private, which is not open source, right? Um, and uh, a couple of pointers or like arguments that maybe some people will bring in is that, well, um, maybe it was necessary for economic sustainability of the project. Looking at some of those companies like Elastic and Mongo, they were really large companies in their own right before the license change. I don't think they really needed it. Um, there's a couple of projects like New Linux, right, that is used by uh, a lot of these vendors or managed ser services, uh, and it's still immensely popular, maybe because of and not in despite of. Um, and even taking enforceability out of the picture because uh, suing and winning these cases of copyright infringement is actually really hard and not something you really want to do. Um, changing to a restricted, more restrictive license mostly means that companies and community members move away from your project, which is what could actually be detrimental to the project itself. So while cloud vendors may have stopped using these programs, they have also stopped uh, or made sure that people move on to alternatives and not use these projects anymore. And some people even argue that some of these companies like Mongo or Elastic were never really open source to begin with. Um, I don't agree. I think they brought tremendous value to the community, but then again, uh, thought open source could be their business model. Okay, I wanna look at a couple of recent license changes by uh, companies. This is, a, I think, the most recent one. Uh, Lightband changed ACAS license from Apache 2 to uh, the BSL, uh, which is a business source license, starting with ACA 2.7, which uh, will be uh, delivered this, this October. So you have a small time window where you <laughs> need to figure out what to do there. Um, and with any such change, there's always talk of a fork. Uh, I've even heard really close talk of a fork. Uh, but, and I've seen people advocate for forks that have like a really aggressive copy left license so that the now newly licensed project uh, needs to uh, go through a lot of hoops to get the bug fixes that open source community would come up with. But I, I don't think that's incredibly effective because you're mostly pissing off people that are using this technology because it's actually kind of hard to switch away from something like ACA, it's like a core piece of technology, uh, can't easily be replaced. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that is built on top of ACA. So if you're, if you're just forcing this upon uh, the, the core project, you're just pissing off your fellow, fellow community members, right? You're not, you're not actually making a, a difference here. All right, another one. Um, and this comes with a disclaimer because uh, Ivan is actively involved with driving open search forward as the open source variation on Elasticsearch. Um, but when Elastic released this publication of their license change, uh, a shockwave went through the community and several players eventually then uh, worked on open search, uh, including AWS. Apache Kafka development, uh, Kafka is another product that is in the Ivan portfolio. Uh, or rather, what, what stuff makes it into the Kafka project is largely in Confluence hands. And this single vendor sort of issue or like prominent vendor issue is, is, a, is a difficult one, right? But it's not one that we don't know about. Databricks has a stronghold on Spark and Google and Beam are a very similar story. Grafana, uh, Loki, and Tempo released uh, or changed from uh, Apache to new AGPL, which is a very infectious copy left. And Google warns against using uh, AGPL because and saying that the risk heavily outweigh the benefits. Uh, the CNCF Cloud Native uh, Computing Federation, in response to the license change of third-party dependencies, said that. Uh, the, 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 the ways forward really are for anyone to either freeze the component prior to the version, like to the version prior to the license change, uh, to switch to an alternative uh, component, or to ask the government, uh, governing board really nicely if they can have an exception. Needless to say, they were really unstoked about this change. If you st install anything, but for instance, let's let's take uh, Electron as an example, you have to add 87 packages. And with 87 packages comes 87 dependencies, uh, license dependencies to be uh, exact. Um, and every such package likely has all of their own dependencies. So that sort of like spirals into this immense uh, 
uh, licensed landscape that you have to uh, keep, keep track of. Um, and with license uh, tracking, you, you can't even do that manually anymore. It's just, it's just ridiculous. Um, because if, and if you do it incorrectly, right, then you introduce a lot of technical debt. There are over 300 uh, different licenses, and that list is just ever growing. We just talked about ethical source, it's kind of like a recent change. Um, but the good news is that only about 20 licenses are used for about 80% of the projects in open source. So you could, for instance, come up with a an deny and allow list and then have a tool check against license changes in your stack. Um, on this slide, you'll find a tracking tool that is actually really helpful in tracking changes in the licenses in your stack. And you will want to do this because uh, license litigation I said before, it is actually kind of hard, but say it happens. Uh, it might force you to release your code under the same license as the package dependency that you've used. Uh, you might be, be sued. Uh, you might have to rewrite, uh, rewrite large parts of your, uh, of your stack, of your infrastructure. You might get penalties, restrictions until you meet the actual uh, license. Uh, but, and last but definitely not least, you might uh, have see loss of reputation and some very negative press coverage. Okay, I want to switch gears a little bit because we talked about licenses a lot and it's like, I can see in your faces, it's tiring. <laughs> um, open source libraries, packages, dependencies, they help you to move quicker, right? But if they're poorly maintained and if they're not healthy, they just introduce a bunch of risk. And in 2016, that example was LeftPad. I was in an open space yesterday where we were talking about inner source versus open source, and we were talking a lot about these type of topics. Uh, we actually mentioned LeftPad, I think. So the problem, LeftPad was a really, really small, or is a really, really small library, and it only sort of like uh, pads out the left-hand side of strings, right, with like uh, a bunch of stuff. But the thousands of projects relied on it, including Node and Babel, so, you know, widely used stuff. Um, and with LeftPad removed from, uh, the MPM, from NPM, uh, a lot of stuff broke. Yeah, um, It was removed by the maintainer because he had another NPM library called Kick. Uh, there was a messaging app called Kick. Uh, their lawyers thought it was brand, uh, brand infringement that he was using the name Kick. And sort of out of spite because NPM uh, what tended to agree with the lawyers, uh, he just unpublished all of his 200 libraries, uh, including LeftPad. NPM actually sort of like pulled back this change and made sure that uh, LeftPad was still available and the internet stopped breaking, which is a good thing. Um, but the maintainer really felt like, oh, so corporate needs are definitely more important to you, NPM, than the people, than the community. I think if someone like the LeftPad maintainer had had access to representation, this could have all been avoided. I was told to put in some jokes because it's like a difficult topic and it's in the morning. Also, it allows me to take a sip of water. All right, let's talk about Chef. Seth Fargo, after discovering the contract between uh, automation uh, company Chef and ICE, uh, deleted his code and therefore sort of disconnected Chef's services for a bit. Um, it was a temporary thing, of course, because we can roll back to stuff, which is good. Um, and there's also nothing that Seth can do uh, about it, really, because his code was licensed as open source. Um, so he can't really define whoever gets to work with his stuff. Um, he sort of claimed that all of this code was living in a, pri like a personal repository. Um, but then again, it was created in a time that, chef, that he worked at Chef. Um, it was a kind of like a big uh, 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 back and forth. 
Um, and one thing that he mentioned, and I thought it was really interesting, is that in his will, it actually says that the day that he dies, all of his social accounts, but also all of his code will be deleted from GitHub. Uh, so we need a sort of a contingency plan for when that happens, right? Like, it could happen. Um, there's a couple of more examples. Uh, Colors, JS, uh, Fakers JS, um, two NPM repositories uh, that are out there. Colors has like 3.3 billion downloads in its entire lifetime and like 29,000 projects that rely on it. Uh, Fakers is a bit smaller with 3.3 uh, million uh, downloads and uh, 2,500 uh, 2, projects relying on it. Um, but both projects were maintained by the same, um, uh, same author. Um, very basic functionality, but apparently very, very core to some of the, these, these projects that, or these companies that have adopted these dependencies. Uh, Colors lets you print colored output on your terminal, I think, and Faker creates some fake data so that you can use in staging and testing. Um, so the Colors version that was hijacked by its own maintainer uh, printed out an infinite loop printing liberty, liberty, liberty by, and then followed by sort of like a sequence of, of gibberish. Um, the developer itself, himself uh, created this infinite loop and sabotaged its functionality and also purged all the functional code from uh, Faker uh, in the version 6.6.6, .6 which I think sort of should have given it away to anyone following versioning, but mm, it doesn't matter. Um, it's likely that this stunt sort of relates back to a comment that he made in 2020, which was that uh, he doesn't want to work for free anymore and that if anyone wants to use his code or wants to make sure that he continues to work on, on his projects, they should uh, give him, and I quote, a six-figure salary. Not IPC. This was mid-March this year, uh, I believe. Um, the developer behind the popular NPM package Node IPC uh, sabotaged versions of his library in uh, protest of Russia's attack on Ukraine. Um, so while the first versions were kind of like child play, uh, it would just create a document on someone's desktop uh, with a sort of a peace message. Uh, later versions were actually really harmful uh, and would delete anything on a per, uh, person's computer, especially for people that were based in uh, Russia or Belarus. So open source is part of our infrastructure, it's part of our products, and it's part of our tooling, and we need to care about those uh, things like they were our own projects. So. No company would leave any crucial software that was developed in-house uh, unmaintained. Still, we're willing to accept that this might be the case for the dependencies that we rely on that are open source. So documenting licenses and monitoring changes should be uh, part of any company's SBOM. You alluded to it, Software Bill of Materials. Uh, it's incredibly important to keep track of what you're using uh, and make sure that you avoid things like I've just mentioned. And I would love for you to have a think about what are the departments or roles within your company that are responsible for identifying and mitigating uh, the impact of license changes? And what projects in your stack may be at risk of doing a similar move like Elastic did? Who's looking at the health of the projects that you rely on? And who leads research and sort of due diligence in finding alternatives for if components in your stack will f fall over. Of course, I'd be remiss not to talk about Log4j. Sorry. Uh, thought you, <laughs> you could miss out. No. Um, so of course, uh, remote code execution vulnerability scored 10 out of 10 uh, on the CVSS, the common vulnerability scoring systems. That's good. Um, and the, the impact was, or actually is, huge, right? From like really small hobby projects to the number one programming languages, actually. Um, 
And even if you scanned your code bases and you thought you were in the safe because you were not using log4j or you're not a Java application, uh, you could still rely on dependencies that did rely on log4j. Uh, security firm, firm SNCC actually fi figured out that 60% of, of all Java applications rely on, the, uh, uh, on that particular library directly and then 40% uh, indirectly. And it's been maintained by the Apache Software Foundation, so that would signal health, right? Like you would think that you're in the safe. Um, and we sometimes talk about open source as being inherently secure because we have all of these, uh, this code out in the open, everybody can look at it. If we find something, we can fix it, right? But I have found that most developers go to open source to find solutions and not to fix stuff. Um, and that's a problem. Security is hard. Um, I mentioned SNCC already. Uh, Lirenthal, who is a developer advocate at SNCC, uh, uh, spoke at a conference quite recently, uh, and uh, <laughs> the room was really quiet because it was really uh, hitting home everything that he said. Um, and he said something like, installing an average NPM package introduces an implicit trust on 79 third package party packages and 39 maintainers, creating a very large attack service. Um, so make sure you invest in supply chain security or find a very friendly managed solution who will do that for you. Visualization on the screen represents the 1600 dependencies that uh, occur every time that you set up a new React app. I feel like I'm sort of like bashering like JavaScript and I'm sorry. Produced by um, Harvard Innovation, Laboratory for Innovation Science and the Open SSF is this uh, report, Census 2. Um, it sort of investigated the, li the widespread use of open source and what we should be looking at for it to, you know, like enter into a new century. Um, and one of the five things that they find, found out are the most important takeaways of this entire uh, report. So you don't have to read it. I figured it out for you, is that point three, much of the most widely used uh, uh, free and open source software is developed by only a handful of contributors. I found this to be a super interesting tool, uh, criticality score, it is still very much in beta and it's uh, been developed by the open SSF as well. Um, and its goals are to generate a criticality score for every open source project. Um, to create a list of critical projects that the open source community heavily depends on and to use this data to proactively improve the security posture of all of these projects. Log4j wasn't even on the first place, by the way, so that should tell you something. Um, it's an interesting project. It scores a project uh, uh, with a score between zero, which is least critical, and one most critical. Um, and definitely worth figure, uh, like looking at it and seeing how this one develops. Um, all right, so I said in the beginning, what can we do as individuals? What can we do as organizations to make sure uh, that we make open source a sustainable and reliable ecosystem? So as an individual, you can contribute, but be aware that sometimes uh, a maintainer or a project might not actually be looking for more contributions. They might have more than enough, but just not enough time to review all of those uh, contributions. So be careful, uh, be a wonderful open source citizen. Uh, also, if your otherwise amazing patch is not accepted, there's probably a reason for it. No need to push. You can be a advocate for free and open source software within your company. Not everybody is aware of the rules of engagement or even the widespread use of open source. Many of the people in your company might not even be aware that you rely on like 96% open source stuff. And as an organization, you can of course fund, uh, maybe you can even put maintainers on your payroll. If there's definitely packages that you rely on, software that you rely on, consider hiring those maintainers. They might not be able to do this stuff full time, but also make sure that they are operating outside of all of your org, org changes and you know, like new strategies and that they don't need to sit into a, a bunch of product meetings where they need to figure out how they balance uh, whatever your, pro your, your company needs as new features and the community actually needs. 
think an interesting uh, way to look at that is uh, looking at the principles of authentic par participation. Um, this was uh, derived from the Sustain Summit in t 2020 in Brussels. Um, there was a uh, community discussion about some of the ways that companies can better engage in open source communities. Um, and so some of the, the principles of authentic participation are meant to give a common language for sustainable and uh, authentic participation in open source communities, help companies uh, take away a deeper understanding of what community accepted norms for participating are, and to encourage others to create new knowledge um, by using this as a reference point. So uh, authentic par participation for a conference, uh, for, for companies, that starts early, so you don't rock up to an open source project with an entirely, you know, like mature contribution that you want to sort of like push through. Like it puts the community first, not the company. It starts with listening. You might, not, you don't know what you don't know. Ask a lot of questions. Has transparent motivations. Enforces respectful behavior and ends gracefully. If there's for any reason, you know, like you need to pull out of this support for the for the project because org changes then make sure there is a contingency plan and uh, you're not just sort of like leaving mic drop style. Foundations like the Apache Foundation, Linux Foundation, CNCF are great partners if that's uh, what you're looking for. Uh, they have incubation programs uh, that you might want to uh, have a look at. Um, Open UK is a very great local partner that you might want to look at. They're also situated in one of the wings, I believe, right, as a, as a partner. Uh, so maybe get your company to invest in, in those kind of projects and make sure that they put the right people in the seat that you might get on a board of one of those foundations. So to wrap it up, I've seen yours, yes, I've seen it. <laughs> Discussions around sustainability of open source are super hard, but they're necessary. Uh, and I hope that you will invest the time to understand the risks uh, of using open source, but then also help open source help open source. Thank you.